we look at the Centers for Disease Control, more than one out of every six people, and most estimates claim that's low, because most people who have it are asymptomatic. Mm. And can still shed the virus. Up to 90% of individuals who have this are unaware of their infection. The largest epidemic no one talks about. When you don't bring stuff up, it's just not good. When you don't put it on the table and discuss it, it's yeah. dangerous. There's a misunderstanding on how is it contagious, when can you spread it. And like Brian said, because we don't talk about it in the church and it's just not a conversation, there's a lack of information, a lack of knowledge. For many people living with this common disease, the most debilitating symptoms are shame and isolation. Shame and isolation. Shame and isolation. Shame and isolation. Somebody wrote to us and said they're hurting. They feel alone. There's times when they just want to end it all. Yeah. And it has to do with the isolation they're feeling after being diagnosed with herpes. Half of young women have an STD. What? So here's how the article says it. Highly stigmatized genital herpes is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections that your doctor isn't testing you for. Most people, in fact, don't even realize that they aren't being tested for herpes when they request a full STI sexually transmitted infection screening. As far as I can tell, no one's ever yes. sought to find that number. Right. But what I can do is surmise based on the fact that I know that even though they shouldn't be, Christians are sexually active and have been throughout history. And I know the number of people that have STDs and it's growing like crazy. There's no doubt that Christians have it in the church and they're right. not talking about it. We think of singles, but this is affecting married people. You know what we're about to do? We're about to get real. We're about to have conversations that Christians have behind closed doors. The scary ones. The ones that make you feel uncomfortable. That's where we're going. Why? Because we're family. Ustedes son mi familia. So this is the Brian and Janelle podcast. She's Janelle and I'm Brian. If you don't want to miss anything, all you have to do is just hit that subscribe button to get a notification whenever we drop a new episode. This is the Brian and Janelle podcast. We got a text from somebody a couple of days ago. and They're hanging out with us right now. Good morning, friend. They said, essentially, I'm, I'm going to give an abbreviated version while we talk about, while we begin to talk about this. But they said, essentially, can we talk about something? I don't know who to talk to. And that made my heart sink. Oh, yeah. Because around here, we, we say that we're family. Mm-hmm. And that has implications. Mm-hmm. And, and this is not just around, honestly, it's not even just around here we say we're family. It's biblical. Right. Almost every analogy you see in scripture has to do with family. And I mean, the family of God, we're all adopted into the family of God through mm-hmm. the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. So we are family. If we you're a follower are. of Christ, you're family. But like you said, it was sad when we got the message, but what an honor. And it reminded me of what a blessing it is to have a ministry like WCRF, which has been here for more than 60 years, because you get the opportunity as a family, as God's people, to touch on topics that just don't come up at church and we'll get into like why, you know, but it's such an intimate interaction we get to have. So I was just so glad that that she or he felt free enough to come to us and that we get to discuss it because it's easy to take for granted, you know, simple things like that that are not easy to discuss Mm -hmm. in the local church. Yeah. And we essentially have always had the ethos that we'll talk about whatever. Right. We want to draw closer to Christ, whatever that takes. So today will be a family discussion, more mature in nature. Parents, you can decide what you need to on that. But we just want to say to Anonymous, who's listening, we love you. You have so much value. Yeah. To us and to Christ. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you're not Anonymous right now and you're listening, same with you. Right. We love you. (laughs) And you have a lot of value. Absolutely. In Christ. So we asked this wonderful individual who said they didn't know who to talk to a little bit more information as we were trying to figure out exactly how to talk about this on Christian radio. And we got a reply back, and I'm going to read parts of it for you now as we get set up, because I want you to get your heart where our hearts are. They said, there's nowhere to meet people like me. There's Alcoholics Anonymous and no government affiliated place to lean on as support on the days when I just want to end it all. There's Facebook groups that you could join, which is extremely helpful, some videos. But ultimately, I feel like an alien. Will anyone ever love me? 
People treat you differently. Family, friends. The man with leprosy is all too relatable. And remember about those stories of the lepers and leprosy. I mean, you were isolated as a leper in, uh, in, in biblical times. Couldn't be around regular people. But Jesus was like touching lepers and, mm-hmm. and getting close to them and loving them, you know? But we got somebody in our family, in your family, friend, who's, call it, who's texting us to say they have nowhere to turn. They don't know who to talk to. There's nowhere to meet people like them. There's nowhere to find support. Will anyone ever, ever love them? And how do they get support, especially on the days when they say, quote, I want to just end it all? Mm-hmm. So get your heart there before we get to what is actually causing them to feel this way. Because that matters to know that they feel this way. I would never want anyone in my family to feel that way. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine right. if one of your siblings came to you and said that? Oh, yeah. And acknowledging it openly to someone means that it's been going on personally, privately for quite a while. Exactly. Most of us, it takes, when we struggle with something, it's difficult to talk about. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. for some people, it could be years before yeah. they talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But family, you got someone in our family who says they just want to end it all some days. And they don't know who to talk to. They feel like they have nowhere to go. And they're not sure if anyone's ever going to love them. What really is going on here? And, and is it time for the church to do something about it? And thanks to a couple of you, I've already texted some sweet notes of, of encouragement and mm-hmm. love before you even know what's happening. Yeah. yeah. But I got to be honest, for some of you, it's going to be a game changer right away when we talk about what's going on here. And that's why we have to talk about it. So the initial text in full reads this. Can we talk about STDs and disease? I've been diagnosed with herpes and I don't know who to talk to. Future topic. Mm. And we saw that and we were like, don't know who to talk to. Mm. I mean, clearly, if they're texting their Christian radio family, they don't know where else to go. And clearly, since they've been diagnosed, they've already talked to a doctor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we said, you know, we love you. We'd love to do talk about this for you, but could you give us more information? So here's the specifics, um, in part at least. There's nowhere to meet people like me. There's Alcoholics Anonymous and no government-affiliated place to lean on as a support group on these days when I feel like I just want to end it all. There's support groups that you could join, which, or there's Facebook groups you could join, which is extremely helpful. A few videos, but ultimately I feel like an alien. Will I ever find a man to love me? And then to know that I got herpes from the guy I lost my virginity to the very first time crushed. Wow. Oftentimes the stigma with this is that it's from people who are rampantly promiscuous. Right. That's what's assumed, right? Not true. They said people treat you differently. Family, friends, the man with leprosy is all too relatable. Words like disease, infection, outbreak are alarming by nature, but fail to convey useful information. Uh, And then she goes on to talk about some of the uh, specifics regarding the disease itself. And I'm actually going to start adding in some other pieces of information because I didn't, I haven't done much research on this before. Mm -hmm. What was interesting is uh, one article is called this, you probably have herpes, so stop laughing about it. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot more common than we think. And it starts this way. They call it the Scarlet H. Hmm. Think Scarlet Letter back in the day, right? That was for yeah. adultery. adultery. Right. But now, what is? it's not adultery anymore. Look at our society today. Mm-hmm. It's called the Scarlet H. Here's the interesting part. If you look at the Centers for Disease Control, more than one out of every six people, ages 14 to 49, have genital herpes. More than one out of six. And most estimates claim that's low. Why? Because most people who have it are asymptomatic. Mm. Oh, wow. And can still shed the virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how about this one? When you do an STD screening, they don't include herpes. What? That's crazy. So STD screening. So what are they testing if not? (laughs) What? So here's how the article says it. Highly stigmatized genital herpes is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections that your doctor isn't testing you for. Most people, in fact, don't even realize that they aren't being tested for herpes when they request a full STI training, uh, wow. screening, mm. sexually transmitted infection screening. Do you realize that? No. Yeah, I had no idea. I would have expected if I went for a screening, I would have assumed 
that that being such a major right. STD would be included. You'd think so. It's not. Wow. Up to 90% of individuals who have this are unaware of their infection. Wow. And the majority of new infections are acquired from individuals who do not know they are infected. Mm. One out of every six mm. people, generally speaking, 14 to 49. That's like a large group of people. Mm-hmm. And again, most don't even know they have it. How about this one? In the Atlantic, they wrote this. There was an article that didn't surprise me in the title based on our family members' concern here. The title of the article from the Atlantic, The Overblown Stigma of Genital Herpes for Many People Living with This Common Disease, The Most Debilitating Symptoms Are Shame and Isolation. Wow. The New York Times called herpes the largest epidemic no one talks about. The largest epidemic no one talks about. Hmm. So I'm like, you know what I need to do then? I need to find me some Christian resources. That's what we need. Right. <laughs> I you did some digging. Uh, well, I've, okay, here's what I found. Like, without having to really work at it. Mm-hmm. I found the Gospel Coalition, solid Christian resource. There's an article uh, in September of this last year, nine things you should know about the STD crisis. But it's basic, it's like... Statistical and fact-based, not ministry-based or theologically based or mm-hmm. kind of like counseling-based. It's mm-hmm. just facts about the fact there is a crisis. Mm-hmm. Then there was Christianity Today. I got excited about this one. It said, I knew I wasn't alone is the title of the article. And she's clearly starting to talk about what it feels like for her. And she even indicates that among African-American teens, half of young women have an STD. Wow. Now, not mm-hmm. just herpes. I'm saying just half. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a paid subscription article. Sorry, I can't read it. I only have three paragraphs because it, you have to pay for it. Wow. Mm. And then I found one more source of information. I, I can't find anything from Lifeway or Barna on statistics. We're not asking people wow. about this. But what I did find was statistics from the National Association of Evangelicals. They did a poll of millennials, at least on sexual activity. Because, right, a lot of Christians presume, that because the Bible says that you shouldn't have sex before you're married, Christians aren't having sex. Right. End of discussion. Mm. Christians don't sin, though, right? Is that the way? Oh, wait, sorry. Oh. Right. It's the wrong thing to do, but check this out. What they did is they surveyed millennials about sexual activity among millennials. Mm-hmm. And what did they find? Evangelicals ages 18 to 29 who are frequent Bible readers, as in three times a week or more, mm-hmm. 20% had been sexually active in the past three months. Hmm. 20%. Now you might, oh, it's only 20. That's a lot of percent. Yeah. For, yeah. An, for a, I mean, a group for, of people with an ethic that says you don't have sexual right? intercourse before you're married. Right. And reading the Bible three times a week. So it, it lets you know or gives you an idea on the rest of the millennials, Christian millennials. So without a doubt. Yes. Based on not only what Anonymous has told us, and again, let me be clear, Anonymous, I know you're listening. We still love you the same right now as we did prior to saying this out loud on the radio. Mm -hmm. You have intrinsic value in the Lord. He died for your sins. We love you. Jesus loves you. But here's the cold, hard facts. You got people in your church with either, you know, curable or incurable because herpes is incurable. Mm -hmm. It's treatable and curable. Right. You got people in your church with this. And with other things. There's gonorrhea, there's chlamydia. Mm-hmm. You know, there's STDs that we don't talk about that are rampant all throughout, but even within the church, and we don't talk about it. Not at all. Right. Because you did a bunch of research on the same on, on this stuff too. Yeah. Well, um, there was a blogger I found that shared eight reasons not to feel ashamed about herpes. And I liked it, especially because she interviewed Dr. Sheila Loan. Loanzen, she's an OBGYN who actually has herpes. She wrote a book. It's called Yes, I Have Herpes. And she says it's more than about people with STDs. It's about self-love, self-confidence, and kind of moving on. She touches on relationships, on how you can transmit it, just a lot of the things that the misconceptions. Uh, For example, number three, it does not mark the end of your sex or love life. I love that she practically shares what to do, how to have safer sex, even if you have it. She encourages people to be open. But the main thing is, 
um, number seven, she says it is only a taboo because no one will talk about it. Hmm. She even shared in discussions with another medical professional saying, you know, a few decades ago, the taboo was breast cancer. Nobody would talk about it. Yeah. And she was like, now it's shifted. And she's like, I can't wait (laughs) for that to happen with some of these STDs. Because when you don't talk about it, either people don't get help or they live in shame or they they don't flourish. And I mean, especially within the body of Christ, who Mm -hmm. wants that? You know, so that's our question this morning. Kind of like, you know, given the statistics and the numbers you shared, given the number of people in the church living with herpes, living with STDs, is it time we start talking about it? Hmm. And part of me is wondering, like, what's stopping us? <laughs> you yeah. know, is it? And I don't the, understand, like, why? Especially since you're saying so many of us have it, not us. I'm saying so many within the church. Right. Yeah. What is I the taboo? I can't give you a specific number because no one's ever, as far as I can tell, no one's ever yes. sought to find that number. Right. But what I can do is surmise based on the fact that I know that even though they shouldn't be, Christians have are sexually active and have been throughout history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know the number of people that have STDs and it's growing like crazy, there's no doubt that Christians have it in the church and they're not talking about it. And it's so dangerous because I even, like with this conversation, it's making me shift the way I talk about it even within my house, you know, with Mm -hmm. our teens. We talk about um, the danger. When you don't bring stuff up, it's just not good. When you don't put it on the table and discuss it, it's dangerous for our young people. But even within, because now you made me look back at my doctor's appointments we think of singles, but this is affecting married people. Because yes. like you said, people sin within marriage. Mm-hmm. And it never comes up in my like doctor's appointment. It's never a question. Of course. Which is fine, but I'm saying if you look at just the whole population, it's making me wonder what you just said. If it's if they're not testing us, is it coming up in discussions, like making people aware? Even when you ask for S C D screenings, they don't screen you for yeah. it. Yes. But 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 even more than that, I think as Christians, we create this false caricature. Mm-hmm. And while there are people like this, but it's basically, if you're a Christian right now in a church anywhere, no matter where you are, you grew up in a Christian home. Right. You followed all the rules of the Bible without ever breaking all one. All the time, right. And you love <laughs> Jesus now. That yeah. That's what we create in our head. Yeah. And that is not true. There are people who came to Christ at age 50, mm-hmm. 80, 90 not following sexual ethics of the scriptures because they didn't believe in it prior to that. There are people who came to Christ, let's just say even at uh, 25, right? were carriers of this disease and didn't even know it because 90% of people didn't know it, got married, and now their spouse has it. Yeah. And their spouse was never sexually active outside of marriage. And Brian, I know this, I mean— since we're going to get real, there are people who were Christians like and after becoming Christians fell mm-hmm. and lived in sin or committed a sin and contracted the disease and are spreading it. Yes. Either to their spouse or whatever. Because you know, like they've you c- sinned. Yes. We've all mm-hmm. sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just Amen. because you look at someone else's sin and think, oh, you can't do that. We shouldn't do that. What do you do? Yeah. I mean, goodness sakes, if we truly examine our hearts. We're all sinners in some way. Mm-hmm. And just because your sin doesn't result in a lifelong diagnosis of disease mm-hmm. doesn't mean that it's better than somebody else's. Right. Yeah. And if you're asymptomatic, you're getting away with it, so to speak. But you've infected your partner who now, you know, your husband or wife may show the symptoms. Mm-hmm. And I can picture where somebody's saying, you know, you've got herpes. Where'd you get that from? Right. And, and casting aspersions at their spouse when it came from them. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't even know it. No doubt it's a controversial discussion. Yeah. No doubt. I haven't ever talked about this on the radio before. And our our hearts is like, let this be the beginning of a conversation throughout God's people, Mm -hmm. you know, all around. And um, we have calls waiting, texts coming in. We're encouraging, we're feeling encouraged that uh, we're bringing this up. You know, it's the rubber meets the road with the word family. And uh, because we're all adopted into the family of God through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And somebody wrote to us and said they're hurting. They feel alone. There's times when they just want to end it all. Yeah. 
And it has to do with the isolation they're feeling after being diagnosed with herpes. But we're not going to be afraid to talk about it. Mm -mm. And we're going to have Dr. Chen come in in just a few minutes from as a Christian physician and come in and talk to us a bit about this. So we all understand it a bit better. And I'm anxious to get not just his medical, but his biblical thinking on it as mm -hmm. well. But ultimately, we're, I'd, I'd say we have ultimately two questions that are underlying in this whole thing. And it's, is it time we start talking about it? And hopefully everybody says yes. Yeah. But ultimately, why aren't we talking about it? Why? Why like... are we not talking about this as a church when we know it's going to impact people in our congregations? Based on statistics, you have somebody, at least one somebody, probably many somebodies yeah. in your church diagnosed with an STD. Yeah. Diane in Twinsburg, good morning. You're on the air. Hi. First of all, thank you so much, Brian, for even the way that you put this to the, the radio community, that this woman is a part of our family Amen. and we do want to help. Second, when you mentioned that she received it from the first person that she lost her virginity from, mm -hmm. my heart sunk because I want her to know that it doesn't matter whether it's the first person that you slept with or the 20th person. You don't have to preface it because... Sin is paid for by Christ, all sin, whether it's your first, your last, your middle, it doesn't matter. And that she doesn't have to preface it with how it happened, why it happened, anything. She's fully aware of why it happened. And she can go before Christ first, which it sounds like, you know, she has. And now she can come before the family and we can help her in her healing. Amen. Dan, great words. Yeah. I love the clarification. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. It's really important. Now, why do you think we're not talking about this in the church? Well, it's, I mean, who talks about their sex life? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're gay, I don't think, I mean, at least you have a support group, but I'm pretty sure at, at a regular church, they probably hide it as long as they can. I'm sure the church isn't the first place they come out at or anything, maybe premarital sex. I mean, until you hear a testimony at a Bible study from somebody, which that's the first thing I thought about. If this person would start by saying the statistics you said, that one in six yeah. have this, that I'm shocked. And that's only because I live in a bubble. And if somebody started by saying that and then said, and I have it, then there's somebody else who's got to go up and say, I do too. And this is when... I think we as a church have to stand up and give our testimony and say, this is a consequence of a sin that is going to be with me. You know, yeah. it, like someone said, you know, there's people out there that don't know they have it. And yeah. at least this woman knows she has it and can ask for forgiveness. And this is something that happened to her that may not happen to other people. Yeah. How many other people don't get pregnant and they had premarital sex? Right, you know, right. the person who gets caught is no better than anybody else. Yeah, and and you know, you bring up such a good point, Diane. Thank you so much for your encouragement and your words of wisdom there, because Doctor Slattery points out to us on a regular basis that the church isn't talking about sex, and so, um, yeah. why aren't we talking about this? Because we're not even talking about sex in the church. Yeah, but then also, isn't it interesting that if someone has a child out of wedlock, which is a consequence of sin? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's kind of in our in our psyche a redeemable offense because you know babies are cute. It is, and and ultimately over time it's like well okay over time you know. oh well yeah I see with this one over time same sin so yeah. to speak different right. consequence we've mm -hmm. got one person who ultimately gets support from everybody else and another person who feels alone and like an alien yeah isn't that interesting mm -hmm. right and I know we don't talk about our personal lives. But part of me is wondering, like, okay, as a church, we want to be about the business. We want to do more than just we get together on Sundays to worship, which is what we're about. What I'm saying is it's also God's. Remember how, you know, Jesus says, I'm here for the sick. Like, we should be <laughs> yes. about the business of talking about our personal lives. You know, if you're struggling with sin, if you're struggling, like, We've talked about women feeling abused or men feeling emotional, whatever it is. What can we do so that people can come and really put it out there and say, I need, Hello, you know, Dr. I Jen. need help. Jennifer yeah. in Akron, good morning. You're on the air. So I am, a, I'm, I go to church every Sunday. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. But before that, 
I was having sex out of wedlock with my children's father, um, and he was having like sex outside of us, of course. And so I got herpes for him when I was seven months pregnant with my youngest son. Um, and I remember thinking it was the end of the world. In my mind, it was like getting HIV or AIDS. And, you know, I completely shut down. I was hurt. And it took the kid's grandmother to tell me, you know, this is not the end of your life. This is not the end of the world. And so I kind of shied off away. You know, I got back into church. I got back into the things of God. And then I um, met my husband. And I remember telling him that I had something to tell him, and he didn't want to hear it. Whatever it is, you don't need to tell me. No, I do need to tell you because it needs to be known. He was so understanding about it. We've been married for two years now. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, and it's really not the end of the world. There's different levels of it. Um, for myself, my medicine is as needed. I never have an outbreak unless I'm overly stressed out and it wears on my body, and that's when my outbreak comes. But other than that, I don't have it. And it's not something that I do share openly, even to my children, even to the child that could have been affected by it. And through the grace of God, it didn't affect him. It didn't touch him at all. But you're saying when you were first diagnosed, what made the difference for you was your children's grandmother. My children's grandmother talking to me about it um, and letting me know that it was okay. I yeah. always thought it was something bad. Um, an aunt of mine, she has it, and she actually developed it in her marriage when oh. they yeah. were Christians and going to church, and yeah. my uncle stepped outside of the marriage, you know? And wow. so it was kind of, it was this horrible thing for me. Yeah. So now, Jennifer, one of the big concerns for Anonymous who texted us is she said, she asked the question, Will I ever find a man to love me? And so, and yes, you will. And okay, but you must have been horrified to talk to your now husband about that. I was, and when he told me he didn't want to know, and it was kind of like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything. But no, you need to know because if we're going to embark on this journey, you have to know what you're up against. You know what could affect you. Yeah. How did you figure out when in the relationship to bring that up? and to share, you know, because it's a scary moment. How do you figure out when to bring it up? I don't don't know. I just kind of just knew, like, it's time. We had it. We were just dating. We weren't sexually active or anything. But I knew, for me, I knew that I loved him. I knew that, in my mind, we were going to be together for a while uh, just because of our connection. So now this seems to me, my last relationship, but there's not going to be another relationship. Yeah. And he really needs to know what's going on in my body. Yeah, that's great. Jennifer, I can't thank you enough for your openness about on a real difficult topic like this, because I know that Anonymous is listening right now. We've been texting with her and I can almost guarantee she's found some encouragement from you. Thank you for being the family member willing to offer some empathy and And transparency. uh, transparency. Right. No problem. God bless you. God bless. Thanks, Jennifer. Love this guy. Had the privilege of hanging out with him and his lovely wife this weekend uh, for the Christian Medical and Dental Association's Northeast Ohio Branch 2019 celebration. Dr. Mike Chen is a family physician with University Hospitals and chairs the CMDA here locally. Thanks for coming back on the show, Doc. Good morning, guys. Hey, good morning. So we've been already discussing this a bit this morning uh, as we've laid the groundwork. We have Anonymous listening right now as well, where basically she she was diagnosed by a physician with herpes and now just feels as a Christian to be completely alone. And uh, can you start off by helping us better understand the disease itself? Sure. It's a long, complex topic, but herpes is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, It can also be transmitted orally. And so there's two different kinds of herpes, HSV 1 and 2. And like you guys alluded to before, it's very, very common, Mm -hmm. at least in terms of people having been exposed to it in the population. In fact, almost like close to half of people in the country have been exposed to it at some point in time. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody, yeah, that doesn't mean that everybody gets outbreaks. But it does mean that it is possible that in moments of high stress for people to have flares. And I I totally get how, because it's one of those infections where there is no cure for it. Just like HIV, there's no cure, at least at this point, 
to permanently get rid of the virus on like yeah. unlike the ways we kill bacteria and stuff like that in our mm-hmm. bodies or colds so unfortunately people can get flare-outs throughout their lives and these can be very painful they can show up in the mouth and the, the throat um the in private parts um and so it's very painful and there's a lot of stigma associated with herpes or any kind of std um, and i totally understand where the listener is coming from I think one thing that I kind of just sense from hearing the story, first off, when you're when someone is that discouraged and that isolated, I suspect there may be some depression going on. Uh, many times when someone is thinking about possibly ending their own life, that would be, for, for most doctors, something that would concern us. And so in addition to helping the patient deal with the STD portion of it, which thankfully we have uh, suppressive type medications that if you take them either as needed, like the previous listener, or just taking it all the time, which we do sometimes, it can be quite effective in really, really, really uh, reducing the amount of outbreaks people can have. But more importantly, I think, to address a sense of depression, address a sense of isolation, certainly it's something that you probably want to talk to your doctor about. The listener referred to feeling ostracized from her family or her church body. And that that really saddened me to hear it because ultimately... Um, that'd be hard as yeah. a family, of course. Um, and we always, you know, when when there are permanent consequences to our sin, it's always going to be a hard, hard journey to walk as a family. But if you have Christ, um, which I hope this listener's family does have Christ, I think my encouragement to them if they were listening is that ultimately, even though there was sin here, and there was sin here, let's be clear, premarital sex is sin, there's grace in Jesus, yeah. and there is no condemnation you know, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if this listener is a follower of Jesus, then her sins have been atoned for. And as the body of Christ, we're no better than she is. You know, we may not have had that specific sin, but the reality is every single one of us has our thing, our, our multitude of things that God has in his grace forgiven us. So I would challenge this church body, I would challenge this family to say, okay, don't think that you're any better than this person. Because you're not. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. You're not. And in many ways, each of us is worse. And so to be able to have that kind of humility, to be able to say, okay, we're all messed up. Yeah. Thanks to God for Jesus, for being saving us, redeeming us, and helping us to become more and more like him. Um, and that's the process. Coming along, we can either ostracize sinners or we can say, we're with you because we're, you know, we're, we're no better. How do we help you heal? And in terms of being able to talk to a future, hopefully, fiancé, our future husband about this issue. Honestly, if the man loves Jesus, trust me, he's well aware, if he's a typical man, um, the multitude of ways that he has sinned against Jesus, just like I historically have sinned in, in terms of lust and that kind of thing, like purity issues. Right. Um, and so if he's a lover of Jesus, he knows his own failings. And I suspect if it was addressed in a way that was, in all honesty, and wanting to share um, that this is a part of you that you're not proud of, but by God's grace, you know, he's healing you of. That's right. And with, honestly, medications to, to decrease the risk of infection, it's probably not a big deal. And I, but a lot of times when someone's depressed, these things can feel like huge deals, you know? Yeah. Especially if you can't yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wanted to jump in, Dr. Chen, because it's it's interesting when we get questions here about these kind of things, and now we're getting some follow-ups. Yes. That yeah. because we don't talk about this as a church, I think there's a lot of ignorance out there. And Yeah, there is. Um, So one of the things that concerns the anonymous listener is sharing with a potential spouse that she has the illness, but then also with family members. There are family members that don't even want want her to use their toilet because there's like a misunderstanding on how you, how is it contagious? When can you spread it? And like Brian said, because we don't talk about it in the church and it's just not a conversation there's a lack of information, a lack of knowledge. And someone else texted and asked, are you only contagious during an outbreak? Right. Pretty much, yes. You're only contagious if you have an open sore of allegiance. Otherwise, sitting on a toilet seat, even even kissing someone, you know, um, or giving someone a hug, that should not cause any kind of transmission of the infection. If you have so, a partner, what are ways to minimize sharing the virus? So I would say if the partner has a history of herpes, 
then I would have them talk to the doctor and be placed on something like acyclovir or valcyclovir, both antiviral medications. Honestly, if someone takes it all the time, unless they have some kind of immune deficiency like HIV or something like that, the likelihood of them having lesions is fairly small. Now, there's always going to be some risk, but it, for the most part, it is very, very low um, as long as they're both aware, like, do I have any lesions? And you, you feel they, they hurt. It's not like you just like, oh, I have something. Um, <laughs> right. You, and, you know uh, when, when you have an outbreak, you're saying. Yeah, by and large, yes. But if you just take the daily medication to keep the virus levels low, then the chances of spread is very small. But also, a lot of people are exposed to it, but never actually get any kind of symptoms. So, so mm-hmm. I mean, not that you know it's okay to get a symptom, but yeah. right. a lot of people even know they had, you know, they had to carry the HSV virus within them. So now, what I saw from the CDC website is that one in every six people have herpes. Do you see this in your practice, just as a, a practical application? Uh, you know, to be honest, I I don't see a, a lot of herpes. Maybe a couple of times a year, because honestly, most people don't don't realize they have it because they don't have active lesions. And so they don't come in to get treated. But I'm sure there's times people go to ER too, because they don't want to talk to their doctor about it. Yeah. Well, and and, you know, I I was even, as I was looking at the the one article I could find from a Christian source with statistics on it, uh, horrifying to even see gonorrhea is becoming resistant to antibiotics. Yeah, we had to use more powerful antibiotics to treat it. Thankfully, as well, that is, um, at least in my current patient population, it's not um, hasn't been quite as evident. But I think because we have some, in some sense, treatments for HIV now, people are becoming a little less strict about condom use and stuff like that. And so, along with that, even though you can treat things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, it certainly is not easy and desirable because you certainly can have. A, other consequences. I think big picture wise though, as a church, I really think that we need to be able to, first off, embrace intimacy within maybe a small group setting. You don't necessarily need to announce this before your entire church, yeah. right. but yeah. if, if you have a small group, and I, I really pray that most of your listeners do, and if you don't, I really encourage you to see if your church has one. If your church doesn't do small groups, honestly, uh, you might consider going to a different church. Because I think to ha- have that kind of a small group setting where you can safely talk about hard and painful and embarrassing things and feel protected and safe to be able to share those kind of things, I think that's instrumental in being able to grow in Christ and to have that. Because what Satan wants us to is to feel isolated and to feel alone so he can just pick us off. And the way we fight it is to be able to come together and to embrace the reality that we're all messed up. But Jesus is in the process of healing and redeeming us. From your unique position as a physician— Why do you think that, generally speaking, at least in our experience, the church is not discussing STDs? I think it's a hard topic. Things like sex are hard to just talk about because it hits us so close to home. And if we're honest, none of us is perfect there. You guys know my my history. I've had my own failings. Um, And for I I didn't want to talk about it because it was embarrassing and it, it was sad and it was a waste of part of my life. And yet, when we can humble ourselves... And to say, okay, I know this is potentially a little bit embarrassing to talk about, but this is the reality of what my life has been. And this is what God has done. This is what Jesus has done in forgiving me. Then it frees us to be able to be real and open and not worry about condemnation because ultimately Jesus has already been condemned for us. And so we don't need to worry about it. And I think, so it goes both ways, the, the sinner to be able to f- share freely because of God's grace and the congregation to be able to relate and to not look down and just embrace the redemptive work which Jesus has done in their congregation. And, you know, I think as a, as a final question for you before we have to say goodbye here, talk to the person who feels embarrassed to talk to their doctor because of how intimate an, an STD is. Yeah. Honestly, your doctor has seen and heard so many things that are worse than that. It literally, we don't even raise an eyebrow um, because it's so common. It's so treatable. And yeah, for most doctors, and I would I can, I can speak freely about that, it's just another visit, just like treating high blood pressure or diabetes or something like that. It's, it's something we see and deal with uh, like a very regular basis. None of us will be like, oh, you know, you, you're a terrible person. Now, if you come to me, I might try to talk to you about, as I did, frankly, last week to a patient who had had an affair, um, spoke truth into his life. So most doctors probably aren't like me in, in going there. <laughs> right. But 
I mean, the reason I do it is I want to point people to Jesus. Um, yeah, there nothing unless you have a third arm going out, then you're not going to surprise your doctor. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So just talk to them about it. It's okay. <laughs> and, and if you have a third arm, they'll still be okay with you. you yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it probably won't be a surprise because you were born with it. A- anyway, complicated. Dr. Mike Chen is a family physician with University Hospitals, chairs the Northeast Ohio branch of the Christian Medical and Dental Association. Another day where we're truly grateful for you, my friend, not just uh, for your medical expertise, but that paired with your love for Christ and your understanding of the gospel. Thanks again for your extra time today. Absolutely. Thanks for what you guys are doing. You bet. And then remember, go to neocmda.com for more information on the Northeast Ohio branch of the Christian Medical and Dental Association, uh, or just come to us, brianandjanelle.org. We'd love to connect you. We'll talk to you next week, Doc. All right. See you guys. And Anonymous is with us listening. God bless you. Thanks for coming to us with your real personal and difficult issue. And here's our summary for you if you're just jumping into the conversation. This person said there's nowhere to meet people like her. There's no, like, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, but nothing for her. Uh, There's Facebook groups, but ultimately she feels alone, like an alien. Will a man ever love me? She said people treat me differently, family and friends. She feels like the leper in the scriptures because she was recently diagnosed with herpes. And uh, let's just say the church is not talking about this. Right. They're not. Yeah. We decided to because we love you and we love Anonymous. And Anonymous is redeemed by the blood of Jesus just like the rest of us. Uh, and let me be clear as well as we talk about this, if you're just tuning in. God has a specific design for sex, and it's within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. That's where it belongs. Right, mm-hmm. But we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and some people sin in that particular way of disobeying that command. I have sinned in other ways. And we're also, um, there are also many who have STDs who haven't sinned and just contract it right within their marriage. Yeah, yeah. And, there, and, and those are things that can actually happen. And so yeah. we're trying to find out why aren't we talking about this in the church? Why aren't we talking about this in the church? Michelle, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. I'm calling um, this morning as a board-certified pediatrician. Mm. I know you just had Dr. Chen on, and again, I don't think I could have said it any better than he did. No worries, yeah. I have some concerns also as far as, you know, why aren't we talking about this in church? Because I think it points right to that we are still sinners. My heart goes out to this person, I don't know if it's a, a man or a woman, um, who says she's depressed. Does she feel like somehow God is punishing her rather than, um, and again, that may be the culture of Christianity she grew up in, and, it's, um, and I don't want to judge her family. And perhaps the Northeast Ohio branch of the Christian Doctors and Medical Association is a resource for her to go to a physician, a Christian physician, who yes. can help her through this. Yeah. Okay. Now, I've taken care of babies that have been infected. Um, you know, as a pediatrician, I've taken care of babies who've been infected with herpes viruses. Babies, both HSC huh? And HS2. And 75% of the parents did not know they were infected. Mm. Oh. So it is a silent disease. Everyone thinks, no, you know. So what do you so, do? Are there things you do before you get pregnant or while you're pregnant. Indeed, as, as Dr. Chen, if you know you carry the virus, there is viral suppressive therapy that a pregnant mom would take okay. all throughout her pregnancy and possibly after as well. So there are treatments, okay? Again, suppressive treatment. But again, you know, um, I can talk forever about the medicine, but again, you know, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, it's more. this woman needs to know that you know, she sinned, as Dr. Chen said, just like the rest of us. There is forgiveness. But she needs to know, she needs to go to a physician who understands and can give her the truth and work with her. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And, um, and if her family, and one can't even imagine how isolated she's feeling right now. Mm-hmm. And especially to be cut off for her family. Yeah. But her, her body, the body of Christ is out there as her family. And again, I think the churches should. I mean, maybe this will spark interest and the organization will get a flurry of requests for physicians to come and talk at church about the untalkables. Not right. just herpes, but other sins that we all commit, but we try and shove underneath the um, rug and say not at our church. Right. Right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, You're Michelle. Very welcome. We we appreciate your patience and getting on the online there. And that's mm. fascinating. Seventy five percent of babies infected. Oh yeah. Oh, 
Yeah. Our you friends know didn't even know they had it. Michelle brought up a great way to maybe bring it up in the church to have medical professionals come. Angela wants to know, okay, what does that look like in the church to talk about it? Well, because I think it's a good point. People don't just sit down and talk about their intimate life at church, whatever that looks like. Mm. You know, so what does that look like? Is it seminars? Is it support groups that we're talking about? I have, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm hesitant to go there yet. Okay. Because I want to keep laying the groundwork here. Because we had another text from somebody who has indicated yes. that there is a culprit in some respects among Christians in why we're not talking about STDs. And we're going to get to that in just a minute here. But I want to, if you don't mind, Janelle, I want to jump to Anonymous here. Anonymous, um, can you, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on this as we have someone really hurting out there today? Well, my thoughts are this. One, as Michelle just said, God is not punishing you. Please, please know that he's not punishing you. The other thing is, is I have daughters, granddaughters, sisters, and well over a thousand Christian women friends. That's not even counting the men. And of all of them that I know, only one claims that she has not committed sexual sin. Mm -hmm. So, let yourself off the hook there. The reason God talks about that so much in the Bible is because he knows we're going to do it. And that doesn't mean we should, but sin is sin. Yeah. And I, I guess I basically just want to say for her that to open this discussion, you are glorifying God because there are so many people who hurt. Right. And I have medical diseases, heart disease, honestly, it's lifestyle. I did that to myself. And it's like, so a herpes is not, like we said, it's not the end all of everything. And my biggest concern for her is the thought that someday she feels like ending it all. Yeah. And it's like, that is the place to start because Jesus died for us. We don't need to die over sin. He did that for us. It's all done. Amen. Thank you, Anonymous. And your transparency on that is important to remember, too, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but also a lot of people suffered from sexual sin right? in their past or their present. And they just happened to be the ones that did not get a disease from it, you know? Mm -hmm. I just want to set my thought on the table, and then we'll let it sit there for a minute. And we'll come back to it. Because we had Angela asking the right practical question on this one. It's, well, how do we talk about this in the church? Not just why aren't we talking about it. Yeah. And here's the uncomfortable reality from a listener that texted us, and they said that we in the state of Ohio have a really hard time passing sex education and health bills at the state level because there's people who do not want to include STDs in sex education. Hmm. And I would venture to guess that there's an element of Christians that when they advocate for abstinence-only education, which, by the way, God advocates abstinence, I agree with abstinence, is the only safe sex. But if we only do that and refuse to talk about STDs, maybe that's the reason we're not talking about it in church. If you just put mm -hmm. your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 abstinence, la, 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 that's it, that's all I'm talking about. Right. What are we doing to Anonymous? Mm. We're talking about a really important topic. I know Anonymous is still listening. We love you, Anonymous. Uh, but this person feels alone and isolated, feels like there's nowhere to go, no one to talk to because they were recently diagnosed with herpes. And so as uncomfortable as that is for anyone to talk about in this day and age, especially in church, we're going to go there anyway because this person in our family needs it. Mm -hmm. And I hope above all else this person is hearing how many people are reminding them that they're loved, that they're cared for. And if they're in a group of people that are not loving and caring for them, they need to find another group of people that are loving and caring for them. Yeah. Sometimes that even means your family, as painful as that is, your biological family. If they're rejecting you, and you're adopted in the family of God through Christ, you got another family. Mm. Right. Am I crazy, though, to indicate that perhaps one of the reasons we're not talking about it in the church is because our method of sex education in the church is just simply don't do it, period? I think there's a lot of validity to that. If you just say this is the only, only way to be 100% safe. Which is true. Yeah, that's great, but not everyone's going to follow that. And as a result, there's going to be pregnancies and disease and mental fallout from people practicing sex outside of, outside of marriage. So right. 
all those things, if you don't discuss it and just pretend, well, either it, it doesn't happen or it shouldn't happen, so whatever comes your way is your own fault and you deal with it, you're not helping anybody. Yeah, I think we're almost afraid we're going to give license to sin if we talk about STDs. Mm-hmm. You right. know what I'm saying? And I understand that fear. I get it. Because I got kids. I don't want to be like, well, if you do it, here's how to be safe. Because I don't want to tell them they should do it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. But even based on the National Association of Evangelicals poll here recently, we've got 20% of frequent Bible readers ages 18 to 29. So that means they're reading the Bible three times a week or more. Or more. You're reading the Bible three times a week. Odds are you really love Jesus, mm-hmm. okay? 20% of them are sexually active. They shouldn't be. And I don't even know how to be super clear about this because there's people who listen very carefully and then stop listening when they hear something they don't agree with. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is it's wrong to have sex outside of marriage. Sex is between a man and a woman, and God's made it super clear what that ethic is supposed to be. I just wonder if we're not talking about this kind of stuff in church because we're so concerned about endorsing sin that we refuse to talk about STDs. And right. we're being abstinent. You see what I mean? Yeah. Lydia in Cleveland Heights, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. And I'm totally on board with everything that was just shared. Brian, I agree with you. Um, Two days in a row, I get someone agreeing with me. It's like my, my <laughs> week <know>. here. <laughs> What's happening? I don't know. Um, but I think there's this obsessive quality about and around sexual sin that the church persists in more than almost any other category of sin, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's to our detriment because sin is sin. We are imperfect. We sin, whether it's telling a white lie or engaging in sex outside of marriage. Obviously, we know that the Bible teaches against all sorts of sin, not just sexual sin. Mm -hmm. And I think that the stigma of, you know, oh, you got a disease or, oh, you got pregnant outside of your marriage or all of those kind of shaming tactics do nothing to help build community and help restore relationships. I think that, you know, when we focus on the shame and encourage people to feel guilty and afraid that doesn't help them and i think that if we preach this abstinence only message it's damaging because we know that people don't follow it regardless i mean paul said himself i do the things that i know i'm not supposed to do the things that i'm supposed to do i don't do them so none of us is any different and it doesn't matter if it's sexual sin or some other type of sin we all sin I think what you said before, Brian, about putting our fingers in our ears and just saying, la, 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 it's not happening. It is happening. And the church is not immune. I mean, look at all of the sexual scandals that have happened within the body of Christ. It is happening. It's happening. So, you know, we don't have any room, any of us, pastors or otherwise, to get up on a soapbox and start shaming people and telling them, you know, you are bad if you do this. It's not about that. It's teaching somebody, this is your value. Your value is not your sexual identity or your sexual worth to someone else. That's not who you are. That's not whose you are. We have to invest in people long before they get to the age, which is younger and younger, sadly, of being sexually active. We need to invest in them and teach them what their value is. And then also teach them, yes, people do sin and have sex outside of their marriage relationship, and that is not what God wants for us. However, here are some things that you need to be aware of. These are some things that can happen as a result of sin. I'm not telling you it's a punishment from God. I'm telling you this is a real life risk that you face if you choose to engage in sexual activity outside of marriage. This is what can happen. And I think it's a tough conversation, but it's necessary. And that's not to scare somebody or shame somebody. It's just to equip them. Like you said, Brian, you can't just pretend and you can't just operate on the basis of fear and shame. You have to educate and you have to invest. That's right. Thank you, Lydia. Appreciate your kind words of support there. Look at that, you know, two days in a row, someone agreed with me. Yeah. Is this going to change how you talk to your kids? Um, I've talked to my kids 
differently than other <laughs> Christian parents. Did you would. talk to them about STDs? Yes, we've talked about all the major STDs. We've talked about if you do, I specifically, especially the older ones, tell them, you know, if you have sex and you get pregnant, you bring it up to me. You yeah. don't ever have to feel, you know, that is a baby. Like I specifically talk about that because I know even as a young person, I could look back and understand like, wow, I can get it why some people, I saw friends mm -hmm. consider abortion because they didn't want to tell their mom. And I've told them like, that's like months of an experience that we would go through compared to a lifetime of consequence if right. we have an abortion. Like we can get through it. I think it needs to be explicitly talked about with your kids and with the church. Part of me uh, during this conversation has been like, okay, what does it look like? I can understand the listener that texted that in. I don't think we explicitly need to talk about herpes or gonorrhea. Like from there's the pulpit a lot you're of, saying or what? Or anywhere? From the pulpit, Bible study. I used to be a table leader. I don't think it's that. I think what we need to do is establish an atmosphere of um, openness, sharing your brokenness. And I think when you set that atmosphere, anybody with anything feels free to share it. They don't feel like I'm an alien. I'll give you an example. Our pastor, he shares this a lot, but because of the sermon last Sunday, he brought up when he lost his younger brother, when his younger okay. brother passed, and the years of anger he felt towards the Lord. Anger. Like, he's a pastor. <laughs> right. You know, so when he shared that, that helps me know, like, wow, it's okay to come to God with anger and with frustration. And I know that's, like, obvious, but there have been moments in my life where I felt that and I would think, oh, my goodness, Ron Hollis, for example, my mentor, would never feel this. Right. Or just assume. Mm -hmm. Or my pastor would never feel this. And then you— that makes you not share it because now you feel guilty. I should know better. And I think that sharing things like that, whatever your brokenness is, whether you're a table leader or a pastor, hmm. wh wherever it's, you're at, helps other people around you say, oh, I can share this with her. Yeah, and I think that's super important, which is why Dr. Chen advocated for small groups. But we, we did have someone text in and say, this has no place in the church. You should deal with yes. it in health class or in your house. There's nothing in the Bible that says you should talk about STDs. In church, there's a lot of things that aren't in the Bible. Right. There's not light bulbs in there. You right. Know? I mean, should we, mm -hmm. should we use light bulbs or not in the Bible? I don't know. Of course we should. Um, we have to use our, our Christian thinking. However, here's my question for you. So like mainline Protestant churches, many of them have something called confirmation, mm -hmm. where it's essentially, it's like a weekly Bible class mm -hmm. for people in middle school to high school ages. And then I know that non-denominational churches will have similar types of things, youth group, whatever you want to call it. Right. Why wouldn't that be a place where you would talk with young people in a church about STDs? Right. Why wouldn't that be part of youth group? I mean, I don't think a pastor needs to do some sort of infographic and like photos and like health class presentation from the pulpit. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. I think they can preach grace and love for the sexually broken mm -hmm. from the pulpit when, when oh, necessary. Yeah. But why wouldn't we do this? Would would you have an objection as a parent to having it in confirmation class or youth group? No, I wouldn't at all. No, I think a lot of parents would like to uh, see what was going to be taught, you know, maybe do a class to them first. But there's nothing wrong with that, you know, being informed. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, doesn't have, this doesn't have to be that hard. So many kids don't get this information, and especially if they're homeschooled. I got to be honest; you're a rare parent, probably, to get into the details on this because yeah. a lot of a lot of homeschool mentality. Because we were in it for a while, is yeah. we're going to protect our kids and keep their innocence, so we're not going to talk about those things, and we're not going to give it to them in public school, so they're not going to get it anywhere. Well, I've been exposed to different people. I think a lot of parents, homeschool or not, want to own the responsibility. Like if my kids were in school. My concern would be I don't want you to, to be teaching my kids because it's a different, like you said, it's not Christ-centered. It's like, I don't know how you're going to teach it to my kids. So I think what I've seen is I want to teach it to them. What we need to make sure is what you're saying, which I agree with, being all-inclusive, covering all of it. Yes, this is what the Bible says. This is what sex should be. But here are the other areas you should be concerned about. And what do you do? Which I guess— I'm comfortable with it. But how do you encourage that and still 
not feel like I'm not giving you a license to go and do it. And see, I, why do you tell a parent that has that concern? But this is my lifetime frustration, especially when I was a high school teacher. Yeah. I'd watch people come in and they thought that high school kids were dumb as a stump. Yeah. Hmm. People totally underestimate the intelligence of kids and adolescents and above. Mm-hmm. And I'd watch this in the eyes of the high school kids while somebody was like baby talking them. Right. And they're just like, what are you doing? And we presume that kids can't think critically as they get older and go into intellectual development. Where my kids are in public school, I'm honestly not that worried about it. Right. Because they get all throughout their lives in every environment, they're going to hear ideas and ideology that runs contrary to scripture. So my job is simply to prepare them for God's ideology and God's thinking right. at home and trust that they're in their own thinking through the Holy Spirit, their own research going to be guided to God's truth. I don't want to just shelter them. It's like, well, I, it depends because this public school is determining when your child is ready. My kindergarten child is not ready for an adult, not a parent to talk to them about homosexuality. Of course. You know, that's and when the one stuff. story about that is shared in the news, everyone thinks every kindergarten class is doing that. It's just right. not the case. Right. But even if it was kindergarten, if you talk to Dr. Slattery, she'd tell you that sex education should begin right away. No, I agree. I'm saying who's doing it and how. Mm-hmm. My kindergarten kids, they like we talk about that. I'm just saying I know my child. I know when you're ready. I know how. And at five years old when it's like, oh, it's okay. And so-and-so can be, I mean, come on now. They're going all over the place. And five-year-olds, I don't know. And no matter what we do, <laughs> but no we matter need what to we own do, it. no matter what we do, they're going to hear it from their peers more than their parents. N- Right. Mm-hmm. I, agree. I don't care if it's if you're a Christian or not. There's a youth group they're going to talk about it, whisper about it. Yes. Talk about it in the hallway when no one's listening. But as a parent, I think you need to be the main influencer. And the church doesn't even need to do that. Like I'm not concerned That's about right. youth group doing That's it right. because I'm doing it. But, but we I still appreciate should do it right. in youth group. Right. So much to cover on this. We gotta run. But if we just scratch the surface here. Lord willing, this might spark a conversation in your own church. And I'm sorry if you missed the whole thing, but there's so much to this. And I just want to make sure we finish with our uh, anonymous friend. If you're still listening, we desperately love you. We're glad you're part of this family. You're not going to be shunned from us. You've heard that from many other people besides us. Mm -hmm. And I want to pray for you before we say goodbye here. Lord Jesus, please be with our anonymous listener. Please help this person to fully know the value they have in you, that they can be saved and forgiven And if they confess their sins, you are faithful and righteous to forgive them of of their sins and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. Guide them towards a community of people that will love and support them. Help them to have hope for a future. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, hold up. Where are you going? You know you liked your time with us. You want more. So look down, hit that button right there, subscribe, and you'll get updated episodes, and then you can hang some more. And guess what? You can help us. How? A five-star rating. You can also hang with us live Weekday 6 to 9 a.m. Interact with us, talk with us, download the Moody Radio app. Or at brianandjanelle.org. And we don't put all this together all by ourselves. There's some great people behind all this production. We want to thank Ron Eastwood, Kelly Ryder, Paul Carter, Doug Hayner, Mike Reynolds, and our awesome and fearless leader, Josue Villa. And finally, this podcast is a production of Moody Radio in Cleveland, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Well, Brian, that's a wrap. Yep.